The Swiss Nazi people wanted to have all the Jews exterminated, have their savings on the Swiss Nazi banks confiscated and their belongings laundered by the Swiss banks. So therefore Switzerland and their so-called direct democracy decided unanimously to hand out in 1941 to their agent Adolf Switler a credit of no less than 1 billion Swiss francs for his Barbarossa Russia campaign and, the, and to exterminate the Jewish race in the East by the Einsatzgruppen led by the Swiss SS Standartenführer Karl Jäger of the SS, who therefore had to write a report requested by Switzerland that the money was uh, well invested and all the Jews of the East exterminated as a receipt. The 1 billion Swiss francs were well used and uh, every name had to be written down in this uh, the horrendous Jäger report um, against later possible bank claims uh, after the war. It is only the Swiss that are that meticulous in these ancient pharaonic ways and eventually these 1 billion Swiss francs were a gift and not a credit because the Nazis never paid it back. Well, not directly. But it was a win-win investment and Swissy got far more back than just their 1 billion Swiss francs. And they knew it. All these facts are only to be found in German and came out um, so many years after the war in a time that nobody was really interested anymore. So this is uh, an article of the Westdeutsche Rundfunk, which is uh, uh, one of the main German uh, radios, broadcasting services and uh, television as well. And here it says, um, Die Schweiz habe einen großen Nutzen für die deutsche Militär- und Wirtschaftsplanung gehabt. So habe Hitler 1941 eine Milliarde, that's one billion, Schweizer Franken als Kredit erhalten für den Russlandfeldzug. One billion Swiss francs as a credit for the, uh, his Russia Barbarossa campaign. And he officially said that the, um, in, it says, on February 23rd, 1937, uh, he would respect uh, Switzerland's neutrality swindle. And well, you can read the whole article here. So, the Swiss really organized World War II, and Adolf Switler was there. Swiss sleeper agent. So this is in a W D R. That is Westdeutsche Rundfunk. So that's a big broadcasting corporation in Germany. Back in Switzerland, no one of their famous Swiss militia stood up against this huge crime, as Swissy themselves sell it to the entire world, that they have a people's militia which will stand up against any crime or injustice, and in fact, until now, never did. They're just selling us Nazi propaganda, so we buy their neutrality swindle. One billion Swiss francs then, that's like one or two trillion dollars today, if not more. Thus, Swissy buying the murder and death of 25 million Russians and their children as well. And just before, on February 23rd, 1937, their agent Adolf Switler guaranteed Switzerland to respect Swiss neutrality. Well, of course he would. Why, why even mention it? These two very important and crucial aspects have been officially documented. One billion Swiss francs for the Swiss francs for the Holocaust and murder of 25 million Russians and Switler swearing never to attack his base in the Alps. This is why today, March 13th, 2015, President Vladimir Putin has had his third child with the 30-year 
Gerald Alina Kavayeva in Russia, which he play, which he plays to love so much. No, in Octagon, Switzerland, of course, where he has been for the last few days, so he can visit his oligarch pal Khodorkovsky uh, at the same time with his new baby girl. Because Putin is one of those Swiss sleeper agents with huge Swiss sleeper cells in Russia who came there with the Teu Teutonic Knights right after the Crusades. They're all based in Switzerland, these pharaohs. So, the, the, so this was in the newspapers just today. Here, yeah. it says, it's a girl. Oh, aren't we happy? It's a girl, you know, another royal... Well, they, these are royals. They are all aristocrats. I've shown you this before. And here it says in... Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the new royal girl, she was born in Sorengo, Tessin, which is one of the, uh, the cantons of Switzerland, where there's a lot of sun. It's quite warm there. So, why not in Russia? You know, why in Switzerland? Well, he's got all his money here. he got his pal Khodorkovsky here. <laughs> And this is where he came from in the first place. They're all Swiss. So he lives in Switzerland. He got, he's got a couple of houses in Switzerland. Uh, he got his money in Switzerland. His friends in Switzerland. His backup in Switzerland. Well, I mean, this is not bad, eh? For uh, uh, somebody who must know, and they all know, that's Switzerland, the place where he's living and where all his his children are, are having a Swiss nationality. Um, a country that's responsible for the death of 25 or even 28 million Russians. And this guy says he loves Russia. Well, forget it. I mean, the first thing you do is not have your children get born in the very place that's responsible for the murder of 28 million Russians. They're all liars, they're all pharaohs, they're, all, they're paid to lie. And all you need to know about Putin, when wondering if he's a good guy or not, that he has his children born in Switzerland, the base of all evil, that financed Switler's Russia campaign in 1941, leading to the death of 25 to 28 million Russians and 6 million Jews, totaling up to 34 million people. Yeah, there you can read the article. Look. It says that um, uh, the, the, uh, the Russian president here, uh, the, the Switzerland's Blick uh, tabloid, and here... It says, the clinic Saint Anna specializes in gynecology and is pop popular with wealthy Russians. That's what I told you, the oligarchs. And the oligarchs are not Russian, they are Swiss. This is the old sleep agents, which it advertises its services to on a Russian language webpage, etc. etc. So this is for the... Um, for the sleeper cells coming back to the motherland. Look at him. Anyway, he's not a real man anyway. He can't, all, all his children are women. They're kind of, a, you know, an, a, any Arab would know if a man just makes only women. You know, he's not. He, he's just pretending to be a man. Look at him. Well, oh, yeah. well, the Russians like it, you know, th this is how he sells himself to the Russians. And also the, uh, the he um, forbid queers, you know, openly to, um, so, so they can't show themselves to children, otherwise they go to prison. He didn't have a choice, you know, the Russians wouldn't accept otherwise. Do you think Putin gives a shit about that?
It's just the way he's selling selling himself. The Russians wouldn't accept anything else, so that's why they love him. But you shouldn't love him, you know, for this. Just use your brains, for God's sake. Oh, which mother Russia-loving patriot would do such a thing and having his offspring have Swiss nationalities through birth as Russia's biggest enemy in the Alps? Well, all the Russian oligarchs went to, like Khodorkovsky and the rest of them, who literally rub Mother Russia blind with the help of the Swiss Nazi banks. Well, I'll read the whole article, I'll put in the links for you. The guy's a Tsar. He's a member of the aristocracy. You know, look, he's all the aristocratic things he's having here. And I showed that before. The guy's, yeah, look. 62 years old. It could be it could be grandpa of the of, of the girl, you know. But I don't think it's a Romeo and Juliet sort of thing, eh? And there's no doubt at all that Swiss Russian Khodorkovsky will come and see the Swiss Putin baby while toasting some vodka together over its future. And maybe even Swiss Obama or Swiss Amma joins in and all three of them together speaking Swiss German, the ancient tongue with pharaonic sounds of the sleeper cells. Wow, what a Russian, eh? Why is not? This is in fact all you have to know about Putin and that he's a liar and traitor to his own Russian people because in fact his real own people are from Oktogon in the Alps. All these pharaohs want to do is set mankind up against each other in eternal wars without end as the aristocracy has always done. It's nothing new. This guy is just a Tsar. So he's probably of the same royal bloodline. Of course she is. And of course he knows that you know who murdered this guy here. That's why he's so silent, you know, because he knows, you know, better be silent because a slip of the tongue, you know, it's that might betray him, who he really is. And he was the head of the KGB. And KGB has all police secret services, services all over the world is Octogon. I've proven that to you. I've shown it to you. He was the head of the Russian Octogon. Well, you know what he wants? So this article here was in fact in the Express with that sort of, I don't know, sort of a Templar showing there. There he is, the Templar. Now you can see uh, Putin, um, that was um, last year visiting Switzerland. And he ate coffee, he, he drank coffee and cake, uh, he ate in cake with uh, one of the Swiss Seven Presidents, Uli Maurer. Maurer, like in Freimaurer, you know, that means a mason. So even his name means mason. And, uh, well, of course he is. And he's even, here's the mason. There he is, and Mr. Putin here. And um, at one time or another, Mr. Mason here, he was the, uh, the head of the Swiss Nazi SVP party. You know, they're all a bunch of Nazis anyway. Mr. Putin in Switzerland. Back home. Another fact is, is after the war, when analysing Swiss gold coins, traces of mercury were found in it, of the amalgam all melted together in one molten liquid, calculating, calculating the automatic separation of the various elements would eliminate the gold from the rest by simply 
pouring it out, only not realizing invisible traces would fuse into one another, only traceable in a laboratory, as the mark of mass murder left its CSI signature on the Swiss gold, the smell of death hanging over it and Switzerland. Switzerland's crime industry shrouded into a mist of the fine material spiritual realm, just pushing forward to come out one day. But one of the blackest revelations came when Swiss gold coins were tested for their chemical content. They were found to have a very high level of mercury, ten times the normal content, which indicated the presence of gold used to fill teeth. A forensic dentist, David Whittaker, thinks the gold has come from fillings taken from the mouths of Jews. You wouldn't expect to find mercury to any great level in refined gold, uh, gold that's used for bullion or gold that's used for making coinage and so on. So if you're finding, or if someone is finding fairly high levels of mercury, then there is a possible route, uh, theoretically speaking, in which you could have got there. And one could set the scenario, for example, of uh, gold fillings in uh, a person's mouth, uh, and also some silver amalgam in the same mouth, or indeed in other mouths uh, close by. There is a possibility, I think, of uh, some of that mercury amalgamating uh, chemically fusing, as it were, to the gold, and therefore becoming part of the bullion. Another fact is that the Holocaust trains coming from France and Italy went through Switzerland. That says, yeah, Switzerland. With the Swiss authorities and the Swiss Nazi people knowing about it, probably transporting hundreds of thousands of people unto a certain death. This has been officially documented as a fact and even a few eyewitnesses have come forward to state Swiss death trains rolling through the Swiss night and through Zurich where some parts of their bodies eventually even would return to. The dental parts, that is. So you can read it yourself. There are some eyewitnesses here. It says Otto Frey, and here was Elena Dreher. And here it, it, they had to go to the uh, to the Gotthard Pass. This and, and you know, funny thing is Hitler he was staying in the Hotel Saint Gotthard as well in Zurich in 1923. So th from Italy, there was hardly any other way than going through Switzerland. I mean, you, you can all see it. Just look at the map. The sponge pores. I put in the links for you. So it, it, it's official. Death trains, they passed through Switzerland. Uh, Swiss in you. Mm. And here it is again in Wikipedia. Here's the Gotthard Tunnel. And there is no other way. You know, there's the only way to bring people from, like from Italy, the fastest way to Germany. But even worse, recent evidence confirms that Switzerland allowed German trains carrying enslaved laborers to pass through its neutral territory. A Swiss railwoman, Otto Frey, remembers being ordered to keep this fact a secret. Ab und zu werden wir bis etwa elf Jahre auf gehört, aber äh, das ist also bei ihm gesehen. Die sind natürlich auch von Ausgangsbahnhof Gasso sind die äh, vorgemeldet worden und wir haben dann äh, die äh, 
mit einer gewissen Sorgfalt müssen behandeln, dass sie schlanker weg äh, wieder zu der Schweiz ausgekommen sind. Even trains destined for the death camps made their way through Swiss stations. There's evidence that in late 1943 in Zurich, a train carrying Italian Jews was halted. One woman remembers a chilling night when she was asked to take soup to the station. There was a Red Cross official, the lady, who told us the trains would come in at night, that we were supposed to bring flashlights, that we would be in teams of four. Very slowly, this, these cars came and stopped, and a man came out from our station. And one of the recollections I had is, although it was very dark, when this car opened, the man who, who, or the face who peeked out was very white. It was very tense. And I also remember I thought, what, what would happen if all of a sudden all these people pushed this man aside and came tumbling out of the car? And, and I was worried. In a way, I wished they would be free, but in a way, I didn't want them to come out. We knew that they were going to Germany. We knew they were Jews. We knew about the concentration camps. Switzerland was clearly not innocent and certainly complicit in some of the most heinous crimes of the Nazi regime. But even as the war turned against Hitler, the Swiss continued to prosper. As German armies retreated, many Nazis, fearing Allied retribution, deposited their ill-gotten gains into Swiss banks. In a nightmare development, this wealth was earmarked to create one of Nazism's most perverse schemes the infrastructure of the Fourth Reich. And me too, 60 years later, they put me in a couple of times in those Swiss Nazi trains for innocent immigrants, which are called jail trains, through which Swiss Nazis, politics, authorities and security companies are filling up each other's pockets in both the financial and political sense of the word. And I'm not even a criminal. So this was in a Swiss newspaper in 2009. It must have been the year they, they transported me as well. And you can read the whole article. You know, they, in the newspaper they put a, a woman in it, you know, to, to make it look harmless. But probably some sort of a lesbian, a man-hater. So well, I, I never saw any women. Yeah. So I'll put in the links for you. The Swiss newspapers, they, they just lie about everything anyway. The Swiss guards were shouting and pushing me, pouring all their evil energies out over me, showing their superiority of the Swiss master race against me, a non-criminal behind bars in a jail train, bullied by these Swiss monsters and here you can see the company of this this is a, a, one of the jail trains it's called uh, Securitas and uh, and here too of that same company it says on its back Securitas in a Swiss jail train and I started to think what's wrong with these people and I had time to think, spending eight months in solitary confinement as a political prisoner. And I thought and thought, and now having set all parts of the puzzle together about this utterly evil people and their incredible crimes against humanity. So after 18 years of Swiss terror, I know them now, and didn't sit idle and beaten down, but I analysed the Swiss monster, the Nazi monster from the Alps. It still goes on today, and in the Hotel St. Gotthard, in the Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich, where Adolf Switler stayed in 1923, when Swissy started to finance him. 
It says, the, he's Hitler, he lived in, the, in Zurich in the Hotel St. Gotthard. This is the, the name of the tunnel where 40, uh, 20 years, years later the Holocaust trains passed through. Here it says, 30,000 francs, Swiss francs for Hitler in 1923. And here he's talking with another Swiss, Mr. Hector Amann, and so on. And today the Swiss SVP Nazi party are having conferences and Nazi dinners in the same hotel. Well, nothing changed really. Here you can see it. Here, yeah, the Hotel St. Gotthard in the Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich. The same hotel where Hitler stayed. And this is the SVP, the Swittler Volkspartei, the, uh, the Today Swiss Nazi party. And here's some more. They have newspapers, you know, of the SVP Nazi Party. And, uh, well, here it says as well. So it's all the way down here. Uh, here it says, in the Hotel St. Gotthard. In 2014, that's last year only, they're meeting and having their having a dinner and conferences, you know. It says Hotel St. Gotthard. Still going on today. Here's some more. They're talking about Hitler on August 30th, 1923, in the Hotel St. Gotthard. Talking about it, and it was nice warm weather, uh, 16 degrees in the morning at 7 o'clock. So this is a family, it's called uh, Ten, Ten Humburg. I don't know who they are really. I'll put in the links. So here's some more about Hitler being in the Hotel St. Gotthard. You just can read here. And this guy here, uh, Wilhelm Hörgner, he even says Hitler was already there in 1921 and 1922. Which, um, which I don't doubt. And um, and it said in a Geneva newspapers that Hitler he stayed there and he got thirty three thousand. So everybody knows it. There came more money from Frau Gertrud von Seidlitz. You see, there's the uh, the aristocracy again. It, they're there. They're always there. Switzerland organized World War Two and financed Hitler. Sorry, Mr. Switler. And in the process of financing Switler, uh, a very important 33-degree mason and aristocrat sp played a predominant role. Jalmar Schacht, who lived from 1877 to 1870, to 1970. Jalmar Schacht's mother was a baroness called Baroness Constanze von Eggers. And as an aristocrat and member of the fair aristocracy, Schacht could raise immediately to a 33 degree mason level of his lodge, Urania zur Unsterblichkeit. So, Unsterblichkeit, that means um, immortality. And that was in 1908. Actually, having this system of degrees to indicate the amount of pure pharaonic blood and genetics they carry our pharaoh's royal bloodline, just like a bottle of whiskey indicates how many degrees or percentage of alcohol the bottle contains. Um, altogether being a myth really that uh, Adolf Switler eradicated the Freemasons. He never did and he was one of them himself. So this is in uh, Wikipedia. It's very important. It's always the aristocracy in it. So here it says, his mother, uh, the Baris, uh, look, his father, his name, Ludwig Maximilian, you know, there's real aristocratic names. And his mother, the Baroness Constance Justine Sophie von Eggers, in a part um, of, in the north of Germany, which is now this here. And, um, and here it says, Yama Schacht was a Freemason and he joined the Lodge Orania zur Unsterblichkeit. So it's the aristocracy 
Freemasonry, as I explained in my film, the Pharisocracy, that Pharaoh never disappeared. They became the aristocracy and who are now ruling in invisible in uh, Freemason lodges. They're all, they're all Pharaohs, I mean the higher degrees, and they're all aristocrats. The nobility never stopped ruling. And here it says he was the president of the Reichsbank. And it says too he became a supporter of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. And it says here too that his parents, they uh, you know, spent years in the United States, you know, you see. And he knew J.P. Morgan personally in 1905, 1903. And he knew even, he was a friend of U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, etc., etc. And I tell you why. Why this is important. Just wait. And as always and everywhere in history, it was the aristocracy, or fairistocracy, as in my film, that ordered all wars, to which World War II makes no exception, as all higher up Nazis all had ties to Europe's aristocracy, as I've shown in my other films. About the Swiss Templars of Octagon being pure aristocrats as well. So here's another one of that royal bloodline who just lived on until 1970, never having done prison and with that concentration camp story of his just being a camouflage and guarantee for his future life of Mr. Schacht Switler's banker. So this is Mr. Schacht, the, an aristocrat, hit Mr. Switler's banker. So here's Mr. Switler, who always carried the picture with him of um, Frederick the Great. And he's most certainly a part of the aristocracy as well. Otherwise, he never got, he would have never gotten that far. I mean, why would he always carry a picture of uh, Frederick the Great? So he's most certainly a descendant of that German Emperor who was also called um, uh, Frederick the Faggot. Jarmar Schacht's parents spent many years living in the US of A where Schacht was able to personally meet important people like JP Morgan, President Theodore Roosevelt and many others. So later on the theft of the savings of honest Americans could take place during the 1929 Wall Street crash with accomplices on both sides of the Atlantic, which I've already explained in some of my other films like Swiss sleeper agents in USA and the Swiss Nazi Templar banks. So, and here you can see what, a, what an aristocrat um, said, uh, Mr. Yalma Shah. So he's really talking for the aristocracy here and why does the aristocracy say these sort of things well because they are pharaohs and they have a long-standing thing uh with the um with this this minority here they are afraid of them well, let's have a look at the fitting dates again from 1903 to 1905, Schacht was in America. In 1922, he was in the committee of the German National Bank. In 1926, he created funds for IG Farben, the Zyklon B manufacturers. Zyklon, to clone, it means actually a, a cyclone, a wind, a, uh, a tornado like. And when the time was right with Swiss sleeper agent Mr. Huber becoming U.S. President Herber, Herbert Hoover and accomplice on March 4, 1929, when he became the U.S. President, the moment was right to strike. The great bank robbery of October 1929, Black Thursday, only a few months after Swiss Huber becoming President. Then again, just a few months after the Wall Street robbery, the Swiss BIS, or Bank for International Settlements, was founded 
in Basel on May 17, 1930, by Yalma Schacht, in order to get the US savings out of the US and transferred into Europe to Switler's Basel Bank to finance the Nazi war industry with that stolen Wall Street money. And as you can see here, immediately they could pay a lot of Nazis, you know, to, to come into the, uh, to, to be paid, you know, that they, they were paid with Swiss money and uh, through Switzerland with the savings of honest Americans. And uh, just look at the facts. So it needed a central bank for all the world's central banks, which is the Basel BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, until this very day, for the US Central Bank or Federal Reserve to get the money out of the US and transfer to Basel, which could only be done by the creation of the world's central central bank or BIS. And this bank was founded by Yalmar Schacht, Switless banker, 33 degree mason, and most of all, a member of aristocracy's royal bloodline of Pharaoh in their base, Switzerland, Octagon. Let's have a look at some more dates. Schacht was the president of the German Reichsbank from November 17, 1923, uh, the same year and the same month of the Munich Switler Putsch or the Switler Hitler coup of just one week before on uh, on November 9th 1923 one week before uh, Yalmarschacht became the president of the German Reichsbank it was all set in place and Switzer Switzler visiting Zurich only two months before until March 7th, 1930, when Schacht worked for the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, and its foundation, one month later. Um, then, when his work was done with the Bank of International Settlements, with all the US money being in Switzerland for the rise of the Third Reich, Schacht became the president of the German a Reichsbank again from March 1933 that's the uh, the exact date when when Mr. Hitler came into power to January 1939 well mission accomplished mission accomplished right the steady flow of looted gold into secret bank accounts in Switzerland grew into a flood Stolen art treasures were auctioned in Swiss art galleries, and the proceeds used to prepare escape routes for senior Nazis to evade the encroaching Allied forces. But in 1944, British and American intelligence agents became aware of these transactions. They responded by initiating Operation Safe Haven. Its mission was to locate, track, and retrieve Nazi assets that were being moved into neutral countries. The revelations from their covert investigation were appalling. Under cover of Swiss secrecy laws, the Nazis appeared to have shipped over six billion dollars in assets to Switzerland between 1938 and 1945. In today's values, that represents at least 60 billion dollars. A lot of this money was to be used to help high-ranking Nazis escape from Allied justice. Let me tell you that the entire Swiss population knows these things and agrees with it, as Switzerland was founded by the Templars and Swissy being the Popes and aristocracy's killers. Nowhere else in the world there's this 100% consent with evil, as in Octagon, Switzerland. The Allies claimed that Swiss banks held $400 million in German gold. After negotiations in Washington, the U.S. and Britain took $60 million in total, and Switzerland kept the rest. It was a gross underestimate of the amount of wealth that actually flowed into Swiss bank accounts from Nazi Germany. It was a very generous settlement from the Swiss point of view. 
Now today already one out of six Swiss not having enough sperms to reproduce themselves. So with a bit of luck the problem will solve itself in due time. Our only hope, because humanity is too stupid and too selfish to stand up against the Swiss evil. Bye bye Swissy, and I hope you choke in it.